I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation. We're here at the International Meeting for Autism Research with one of our pre-doctoral fellows, Christy Bukovecki, who's working with Dr. Monica Justice at the Baylor College of Medicine. Thanks so much for joining us, Christy. And thanks for having me here, Allison. It's great to be at MFAR again this year. And you are working on a project called Genetic Modifiers of Rett Syndrome in the Mouse. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about Red syndrome, what it is, and how it's relevant to the broader autism community. Okay, well, Red syndrome has long been considered one of the autism spectrum disorders. It's really not completely unique at this point, but it was one of the first autism spectrum disorders that we knew the gene for. So, Rett syndrome is caused by a mutation in a gene called MECP2, methyl CPG binding protein 2. And this is an X-linked gene, and um, so it turns out that with Rett syndrome, primarily girls are affected because since males have only one X chromosome, if they have a um, loss of function mutation in this MECP2 gene, they don't survive even to birth. I don't ha have a nicer way to say that, but um, so primarily this is a female neurological disorder, and um, it's just a really interesting situation because the girls go through this period of regression where they display autistic features and they have um, this really stereotypical hand wringing phenotype. Um, they have other problems, breathing issues, uh, eating problems, and also uh, very high incidence of seizures. Um, so. Basically, it is one of the autism spectrum disorders, and it is one in which we know the gene that causes it, which allows us to do more genetic research and to find out, kind of pinpoint the pathways leading to this disorder. And I believe that'll be very interesting for the rest of the autism community, where maybe the specific genetic uh, challenges aren't as obvious. Now, one thing about Rett syndrome, as you said, is we know the gene. So we're yes. able to make a mouse model of Rett syndrome. Exactly. Why is it important for us to have mouse models? Well, mouse models allow us to do things that we simply could not do in humans. So, for instance, um, about four years ago, we learned something very interesting about Rett syndrome with the use of the mouse models. So Adrian Bird's lab over in um, England actually created a model in which they completely knocked out MECP2 in the mouse and then reintroduced it when the mice already began showing a phenotype. So like I said, in the humans, there's a period of regression. This occurs in the mice as well. They are born looking fairly normal and then go th have a situation in which they develop neurological problems, tremors, and the like, and also, I mean, it's, they're such a wonderful model, you pick them up by their tail and they do that same hand wringing motion that you see in the girls, so it's really, it's striking. So what Adrian Bird's lab did is, after these symptoms began occurring, they reintroduced the MECP2 protein into these mice, and the mice got better. So whereas people had been thinking, that uh, Rett syndrome is this progressive developmental disorder, it's irreversible. It turns out that's not actually the case. It's something that can be reversed, which is really something that provides a lot of hope for Rett families, but also to me for a lot of autism families where we might have situations of people thinking this is irreversible and maybe it's not. <laughs> so now, I mean, clearly our long-term goal is not to cure the mice. So how right. do we move from mouse models to treating Real children. People, okay. Um, well, that I think is where my research really comes in. So we are, we have created um, secondary random mutations in mice with the initial MECP2 knockout. And basically, uh, we let the mice tell us what other genes are important in the pathway. So by creating random mutations, we were able to look and see, are there mice that actually don't get the Rett syndrome phenotype as early with some secondary mutation? And we actually did find five lines of mice in which this was the case. 
um, they lived longer because it turns out the rat mice die younger than typical laboratory mice. So they, they survive longer and don't develop the same symptoms with the same level of severity. So this tells us that we, our random mutation is a modifier of the Rett syndrome mutation. And um, what you have funded me to work on is this one line that actually more than triples the lifespan of these mice. <laughs> so I'm extremely excited about it. And we've actually been able to um, identify one of our candidate genes in this line. And it is a modifier. Um, it's a modifier of Rett syndrome, but it's actually in the cholesterol pathway, which is something that people have never really considered seriously in Rett syndrome, but it's really common to consider the importance of cholesterol in other neurological disorders, Huntington's, um, um, Alzheimer's, and the like. Uh, and, and, and in autism. Yes, exactly. I mean, we do have some evidence that yes. children with autism have very low levels yes, of so, cholesterol. Yes, um, very low levels of cholesterol, and actually, the kind of star of the autism world is specifically uh, smith lumley opitz syndrome, where they have very low levels of cholesterol secondary to very high levels of a cholesterol pre precursor, which we're not exactly sure what's going on in rat mice, but we're considering that as a possibility that there is some precursor that is perhaps toxic in the mice um, and in the people, obviously, but thinking that that buildup might be might be repaired um, with the mutation that we found. So obviously looking at the cholesterol pathway, you're asking how this can help humans. It's pretty easy to modify the cholesterol pathway, not certainly much easier than modifying, you know, brain function and uh, neuronal circuitry in adulthood. So I'm very hopeful that Finding the mutations that I have, I could possibly, you know, put a lead onto some drug targets and the like. So, well, we are so enthusiastic about funding this work. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing the results of your study. But we are here at Infar, and you've yes. been here a couple of days now. What's been the best part of being at Infar? Really, it's been the ability to meet people. Um, certainly at uh, ASF was kind enough to host a dinner for a few of the uh, awardees and the Science Advisory Board and the opportunity to meet many of them, share a meal, talk about science and not science was great. Um, and also some of the talks have been amazing, the opportunities to stop at posters and actually this was the first talk that I've or the first um, meeting that I've been to that I've stopped at a poster and actually given helpful advice to someone, <laughs> which was, I felt like I had finally uh, come into the world of science, so it's been very enjoyable. Well, that's great. Well, we're thrilled that you're here and um, enjoy the rest of the conference, and we can't wait to follow the progress of this work. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Here.